I tell people all the time, I'm never ever going to tell them what they want to hear. I'm always going to tell them what I believe to be true. And that there are a lot of lawyers out there that are going to tell them what they want to hear. And I'm not one of them. So if that's what they need, you know, they, they ought to leave right then. Because <laughs> they're not going to find that with me. Hello and welcome to See You in Court, the podcast that informs you about the Georgia civil justice system, what it means to you, and how it protects individual rights. This podcast is a collaboration between the Georgia Civil Justice Foundation and the Georgia Institute of Technology. Your hosts are Robin Frazier Clark and Lester Tate, who are both past presidents of the State Bar of Georgia and currently serve on the board of directors of the Georgia Civil Justice Foundation. And now this episode of See You in Court. Good morning, friends and lovers of the law. Welcome to See You in Court, the podcast. Uh, of which I do with Robin Frazier Clark. My name is Lester Tate, and we do this on behalf of the Georgia Civil Justice Foundation. Uh, today, we are talking uh, about divorce and family law, and we're talking with two practitioners in the metropolitan Atlanta area, Jillian O'Nan and Rob Wellen, uh, who Robin is going to uh, introduce for us in just a minute. How are you today, Robin? Hey, I'm doing great, Lester. How are you? Doing okay. Uh, you know, still not not getting into court any, uh, but uh, I guess that's to be expected and certainly what we need to do to stay safe right now. True. Uh, just wanted to con- congratulate your Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets on a great win over Louisville this past weekend. We, 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 we played on Friday night and we won. Uh, I actually went uh, to the game. Uh, but one of my favorite uh, quotes was from the Georgia Tech quarterback, who's a true freshman. And somebody asked him before the game, said, how's it going to feel playing on Friday night? And his answer was, nine months ago, I played on Friday night every week. So uh, I, I think I can handle that. Friday night lights. That's it. Well, uh, we've got Rob and Jillian today, and uh, they're both family lawyers uh, here in Atlanta. Robin, you want to tell our listeners yeah. about, uh, about these two? Sure. Uh, first of all, let me introduce to our listeners Jillian O'Nan. Uh, Jillian, we appreciate your being here with us. Jillian is the manager, managing partner of the Atlanta, Georgia firm of Elevitz, Edwards, O'Nan, and Berline. And she focuses her practice exclusively on family law. She represents clients throughout Atlanta and surrounding counties in matters relating to divorce, adoptions, child support, and custody, separate maintenance, and domestic violence. Uh, She also handles paternity cases, postnuptial and prenuptial agreements, post-action modifications, and contempt cases. She's an experienced litigator and also a civil mediator and trained guardian ad litem. Jillian previously served on the board of directors for Georgia Lawyers for the Arts, and as president of the Younger Lawyers Division of the Family Law Section of the State Bar of Georgia. Welcome, Jillian, to the show. Thank you, Robin. Sure. And also with us is Rob Wellen. Rob is a lawyer here in Atlanta, Georgia, with, uh, who has practiced since 1974 with an emphasis on litigation and concentrating on family law. He is a former president of the Atlanta Bar Association and been on the board of directors for the Atlanta Bar for, I, I think, over 16 years, Rob, but a long time, let's just long say. Time. Uh, he serves on the State Bar Committee on Professionalism uh, and focuses practice on um, family law, divorce, and especially the emotional turmoil of divorce, custody, and support, paternity, and related matrimonial issues. Uh, so, so thanks, Rob, for being on the show as well, and welcome to see you in court. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, today, uh, one of the things we're going to talk about, I guess, is uh, starting with divorce cases, although there are plenty of things uh, I know that are other than just a divorce. There are modifications, uh, child custody issues, all types of things. But uh, one of the things we wanted to ask you about today that some of our listeners might be interested in is uh, no-fault divorce. And uh, I know that no-fault divorce was uh, a relatively new thing at one time. A lot of states have it now. Some states still don't. Uh, I know when I was in uh, law school that South Carolina didn't have a no-fault statute. 
Some of that's changed over the years. So uh, why don't we talk, start with you, Rob, and just ask you, uh, and Jillian, I'm starting with Rob because he's older. He'll he'll remember. He'll he'll remember <laughs> this. Uh, how, how has uh, how have things changed over the years, and how have we evol evolved uh, into uh, no fault divor divorce world? Well, before I answer that question, if I could take a, a moment to say thank you so much for doing these podcasts. This is a tremendous uh, idea and a great service to the community. I'm delighted to be uh, asked. I'm not sure why, but uh, I'm delighted to be asked, and I just would like to comment on that and how, uh, how I see this as a great, great service that you all are performing. So, getting to the question of no-fault divorce. There are 13 grounds uh, for divorce in the state of Georgia. Many, many states uh, essentially have eliminated all uh, grounds for divorce other than no fault. Uh, there are cases, some of which I've tried, uh, that have uh, other, we use other grounds such as adultery, cruel treatment, habitual intoxication. Um, there, are, there are quite a few that, uh, that have been used even after no fault. Uh, but in terms of no fault itself, uh, the proof is pretty simple. Uh, one party only needs to allege and, and testify <clears throat> to um, that the marriage is simply irretrievably broken. The magic words, uh, and that pretty well takes care of it. Even if one of the uh, even if the other spouse uh, does not want a divorce, so um, it's it's uh, not a new concept anymore, but uh, it certainly helps. Uh, in some respects, to cut down on the rancor of having to prove that your spouse uh, has acted cruelly towards you, uh, and I think it, I think it has played a played a role in that regard. You know, it was uh, going to law school in South Carolina. I, I recall that uh, if because there wasn't any no fault divorce, that the court so zealously guarded. Uh, the fact that we're not going to have a no-fault divorce, that if there was a case where one spouse had physically abused another, you had to show that it was repeated and that it was likely to happen again, whereas for adultery, you only had to show it had to happen once. So people who were, were fooling around on their spouse, you know, that would get you the divorce. But on the other hand, you had to show you were going to get, get the hell beat out of you more than once. Uh, to get it so that they sort of protected you getting from getting a getting a no uh, no fault divorce in a state that did not uh, allow them. Uh, Jillian, I'll, I'll turn to you. I mean, how many how many cases, even in the ones that get tried, even the ones that are not no fault, how many divorce cases get get tried? Is that uh, in your experience similar to civil cases like Robin and I tend to try, which has about a 98, 99 percent settlement rate? Uh, or do folks uh, re really want to have their day in court uh, if they're, they're uh, saying goodbye to, uh, to a marital relationship? Yeah, well, it depends on the folks um, <laughs> as to whether or not they want to have their day in court. But um, I would say it's about the same, 95, 96, some odd percentage of divorces settle outside of court, um, you know, before a final trial. That is that uh, I think a, a large, much, much larger number of them have some sort of temporary hearing and sometimes even multiple temporary hearings along the way where they are heard by a judge. But on a permanent final basis, I'd say very few are actually getting tried. Jillian, uh, talk to our listeners a little bit about a trial. Lesser and I try almost exclusively jury trials. Do we have jury trials and divorce proceedings in Georgia? We do have jury trials and divorce proceedings. Um, uh, I think we're the last state left that allows uh, jury trials and divorce proceedings. There were two. Texas, I think, is no longer allowing them. So I think, I think we're the sole man standing any longer. Um, I've had two jury trials in 15 years of, of family law practice. So they happen very infrequently. Um, juries cannot decide issues related to custody. Um, so even if you if you have a divorce with comprehensive issues, which include custody, and you ask for a jury, your trial is going to be bifurcated. So, you know, the judge is going to be deciding issues related to custody, and the jury is going to be deciding, you know, equitable division of assets and alimony. Um, you know, I, I see people file jury demands, uh, probably, you know, more of a, of a 
leverage type of um, activity because uh, very few of them, like, like I said, are getting are actually getting tried to two juries. Rob, what about you? How many jury trials and divorce cases have you had since 1974? Well, um, when I was working with a, my mentor, uh, we tried um, 11 out of the 12 divorce cases that were held in Fulton County one year. Um, and um, it, over the years, uh, uh, Julian's right, uh, over the years that has decreased significantly in my practice and I think in everyone's practice. Uh, and and um, it, it does take a special, a special uh, attempt to, to make a jury trial, take the jury trial, um, when you have a pretty, good, a pretty good idea of what a judge may or may not do. Um, when, when you file that jury demand and you start going forward on that, um, it's, it's uh, as you all know in, in the civil, civil side, you don't know what's gonna happen. And basically I give them the idea that uh, we can we can probably get X or the parameters uh, of a particular result if we try this case in front of a judge. However, uh, if they are looking for the uh, home run uh, or looking at it from the standpoint of, of um, that, that they may very well do better uh, from trying it in front of a jury, well, that's uh, that's their prerogative. Uh, and and I will support that to the extent, obviously I have to, but to the extent that uh, it does make some sense. I'm not sure uh, that everyone necessarily um, accepts my definition, uh, but I think that um, I do my best to keep that from happening when I see that the result may not be favorable. Jillian, I, I, uh, I, I, for the first, I've been practicing 34 years. I think for the first 10 years, I did a little bit of divorce work and uh, I probably didn't do it very well. Uh, I think I ended up trying four, four divorce cases uh, over the years uh, to a jury. Um, and one of the things that I frequently ran into, though, was the, 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 the case of the betrayed spouse uh, who felt that he or she uh, was really entitled to damages because they had been cheated on and they very much wanted to see the other woman or the other man march into court, sit down on the witness stand and be cross-examined in front of 12 of the, the good and true citizens of whatever county they happened to be domiciled in. Uh, and I had to explain to them that at that time, at least, the law was such that you, you didn't get an award for damages uh, for that like you did for uh, being uh, rear-ended or uh, when, you, when you slipped and fell because the folks at the store left, left oil on the, on the front doorstep when you went walking in. Uh, can you talk about your experience with that now and sort of how that works and what you are entitled to in those type situations as well as what you may not be entitled to? and how that sort of affects the dynamics of the case. Well, I think it depends on your judge. Um, you know, some judges care about conduct. Most, I think, at least in the metropolitan counties, really do not. Um, you know, they're desensitized from those issues um, in every county except for Fulton County. You know, the judge on the bench is hearing a, a murder trial one week and a divorce case the next day. So, you know, they're just, uh, in Fulton, we, of course, have the family division where the four judges that are sitting on the family division are only hearing divorce and, and related cases, you know, all day, every day. So, you know, but uh, I'd say that the, those conduct type of issues are where sometimes people or you, you encourage people or maybe not encourage them, but advise them of, of the fact that a jury might care um, more than a judge does about those kind of conduct related issues. And that that's where the equitable principles with respect to division of assets come into play. You know, maybe I think even in egregious circumstances, judges tend to divide things equally. And if they shift the scales, they shift them by single digits. But, you know, what Rob was saying is is true. If you want to get a sort of a hit it out of the park, home run or, you know, and see the swing by, by more than single digits, you know, the only way to really get that accomplished is a jury. Um, but, you know, there's a big risk in that because unlike 
you know, wrongful death cases where probably very few people on the jury know somebody who's been impacted by those types of situations. Everybody on the jury is going to know somebody who's been impacted by a divorce, uh, you know, and and are going to have preconceived notions about what that ought to look like. Um, so I, I don't see, I, I tell people all the time, I mean, particularly in Fulton and DeKalb and um, judges just really don't care about conduct. And I mean, other than, you know, depleting marital assets to support habits like, you know, sex with prostitutes, yeah, you know, and, and things like that. I mean, that sounds hyperbolic, but it's not. I mean, those are the kinds of things that might shift scales. Otherwise, I think everybody's just sort of, you know, they're not going to go backwards in time to really fix how your marriage was run or the course of action during the marriage. They're just going to look at what there is now, really. Is it is it still true that the only uh, true uh, legal consequence uh, of, of proving that adultery existed is that the adulterous spouse is barred from alimony? Only if it, if the... Uh, if the other spouse can prove a that there was adultery and b that it caused the breakup of the marriage and the burden is on the the the, the spouse the non-adultering spouse so yes that is accurate serves as a bar to alimony if there's proof that it happened and that it caused the breakup of the marriage which of course usually by that point in time that's a symptom rather than a cause um so that was you know. the argument I always used to use with the jury. This, this, this marriage was long over. This was just the consequence of it. This was the flashpoint of it, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Uh, and that's why you're here today, because, you know, the other side's mad about that. What, well, what, if, Excuse me. what if an adulterous spouse uh, gets a sexually transmitted disease and then gives it to his spouse? Is that compensable? We, uh, we had that discussion uh, uh, recently, uh, uh, Robin, that um, yes, it could be. Um, it's, it's known uh, as a marital tort. Yeah. Uh, and typically, you do file that in the divorce action. Uh, we had one um, fairly recently on that very basis. And um, uh, we actually tried that case. Um, tried to settle it, but uh, ended up uh, in arbitration, uh, tried it just recently. And what, uh, what, the, what the arbitrator did was to, in my opinion, uh, was not necessarily to award damages in the marital tort action, but to award her alimony, uh, or in fact really increase the alimony award uh, based upon that. Uh, so I, I firmly believe that that's that that is in fact a, a cause of action, and it can be compensated. Uh, and, and I'm here to tell you that's exactly what happened in in, in the case I tried. Rob, if uh, you know, we used to have a thing actually. When I was in law school and clerked, I filed one of these cases one time in South Carolina. They had something called criminal conversation, which is where uh, one spouse uh, in, a, in a divorce action could sue the paramour, you know, the boyfriend or girlfriend of that spouse uh, for, for damages. And I believe Georgia has abolished such actions. But is there anything uh, uh, that uh, would be included uh, in this marital situation where Robin has outlined that would allow for a recovery against that, against that third party? Well, the, 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 we actually tried the last jury case in Georgia that I'm aware of on that very subject uh, and talked to the jury afterwards. And uh, the guy, the, the, the gentleman was, was a uh, uh, pretty upstanding citizen. Uh, and so they just didn't want to, uh, th in fact, I think, as I recall, it's been many years ago, but I think he was, uh, going to law school, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that, 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 that no longer is the law in Georgia. Um, and, and we cannot recover, uh, for, for that, for that particular, if you will, tort. Other states, uh, I know I recently... As I recall, not recently, but maybe five years ago, had that discussion with a North Carolina lawyer. And I believe back then uh, you could sue, uh, much like what you were talking about. But no, no longer the case in Georgia. There's a law now that's, that says you cannot, cannot do that. But now I will say, following up on that theme, 
that there are other marital torts. I mean, marital tort really is, it, we're talking about between spouses, not, not third parties. Uh, and in fact, uh, you could bring an action uh, for uh, damages in terms of, of uh, what the spouse has done to the other spouse, uh, beating up that spouse, et cetera. Uh, very, very unusual, but uh, I don't know, Gillian, if you've had any ex experience with that. Um, uh, but uh, typically you take care of everything in the divorce and you bring that out as cruel treatment. Yeah, you can, or I mean, or you have simultaneous actions pending at the same time. You know, you can have a, a civil tort action, you know, for intentional infliction of emotional distress or something like that pending at, in a different court system at the same time and, and kind of hit it on both fronts. Jillian, uh, before we leave this topic about um, how property is divided in a divorce, uh, does that include, I know you talk about dividing marital assets, uh, do you also divide debt equally? Is that it both ways, does it go both ways on that? Well, yeah, I mean, the law is not equal, it's equitable division, which of course means fair and, and, and you know, can be equal, but, and, and oftentimes I think just sort of is because you know people uh, you just sort of see judges just not wanting to go back in time and, and reevaluate how people were functioning during their during their um marriage that said i mean i rarely if ever see it as a situation where every asset and every debt to that end is getting split down the middle i mean you look at it holistically you know and look at the, the total marital estate and try to keep assets intact as much as is possible so you know you shift this one here and this one here to offset and Yes, I mean, I, the assets are um, what exists less the liabilities. So, I mean, you do see people during the pendency of an action racking up debt that you know, is really truly unilateral. And, and I think in those cases, it's a lot easier for a, a trier of fact to say, you know, sorry, you're going to you're going to have to take all this. And, and therefore, there's there's that's where the, the swing is from an equitable standpoint. So the other spouse gets, you know, 55% of what remains or something like that. But yes, one of the, assets and liabilities. One of the uh, uh, real issues that uh, that surfaces a lot in, in most cases is determining whether or not um, you have marital versus non-marital assets. And uh, then you get into uh, uh, tracing, you get into all kinds of uh, issues that typically are, are uh, assisted by uh, forensic accountants, et cetera, experts in the field, that uh, they will, they will uh, trace an asset or they will uh, determine whether or not, help us, help the judge, jury, determine whether or not uh, there's a portion of an asset that is non-marital versus uh, marital. And there's a cottage industry now that's developed all, dealing with that issue uh, and dealing with uh, what percentage, if you will, is marital versus uh, non-marital. So in, in many of my cases, I'm sure Julian would say the same thing, in, in, in most of my cases, um, we get into that or some other aspect that a, that a forensic accountant can help us on. Uh, and I try to do that uh, uh, as soon as possible in the case. I'm, I'm having a, uh, I do a little adjunct work out at Emory and uh, tomorrow night we have expert night. And uh, th that's the one thing they say to us is uh, hire us soon. Um, and, uh, and so they are very helpful uh, in, in, a, in a case uh, of, of any magnitude. Rob, I was, I was going to ask you, you know, my, my, my specialty is country law. You know, I, 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 I go to the country courthouse and Jillian got me involved in my first divorce case in, you know, about 20 years recently uh, where it was out, out here in the country. And now uh, we were, we were looking at going and trying it. We're thinking about jury trying it. And I was going to try to help her uh, with that. And uh, we went to a mediation and it turned out we had all kinds of specialists there and when I was doing, uh, you know, divorce cases 20 years ago, you kind of swapped income tax returns, you know, <laughs> you might subpoena the bookkeeper if they did the taxes, you know, one way or the other, or you might, uh, you might subpoena, uh, you know, if somebody had an inheritance, you might subpoena the lawyer that wrote the will or something to explain it. 
but uh, I'm shocked. I'll just tell you, you know, I'm shocked at the level of sort of uh, uh, of uh, a cottage industry that that's sort of become because back then, you know, we, the lawyers were worried about getting paid. You know, we didn't have, have money for that. And I'm sure there are plenty of cases, you know, probably the vast majority that go through the judicial system don't need that kind of examination. And so uh, could you talk a little bit about, is that something that's changed over the years and does it fit a real need? And if it does, at what point does that kick in? You know, like if you, uh, you know, I remember when I used to draw wills, I said, if you got over a million dollars in assets, you need to go to somebody that's an estate planner because I, I don't do that. Uh, and so is there a, a, a level of sort of uh, uh, net uh, wealth that uh, kicks in at a divorce that you feel like that's a good a good time to do that? And then Jillian, if you could jump in behind him on that, you know, love to love to hear your thoughts too. Sure. Maybe you ought to go first. I, I, I don't think there's a, there's a demarca line of de demarcation at all on that. Um, and, and experts charge, just like lawyers do, uh, a certain rate per hour. Um, and so if you have, uh, sometimes you, you just hire them for a specific need, a specific uh, question. So um, as I say, I mean, I, I find it... Uh, that, that, that you really do end up hiring uh, experts in a, in a fair amount of cases. Yeah. Uh, and they, they, they not only help in the one area we were talking about, but they also help with budget, uh, uh, getting people involved in, in understanding what a budget's like. Uh, when the spouse was literally uh, uh, not any knowledgeable about what the situation is, uh, they do what's called a marital balance sheet. Uh, for uh, for the uh, assets and, and make sure that uh, we get them all developed and we make sure and they make sure that we uh, assign the proper values. Um, but but uh, I don't see that that uh, there's any. It, it's what it, it, you want to make sure they fit the right need. And uh, and Jillian is the same way I am. I mean, we have certain experts that we rely on all the time, two or three or four, whatever. Uh, and I, I pick my expert uh, based upon what the need is. Um, there, there's even a, an idea about child support and how to handle child support in, under the child support worksheets. And uh, I've got somebody that I, that I hire for that uh, to, uh, to help on. So uh, like, like I said, it's a cottage industry, but it's, but it's a variety of things that are needed. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll say I always hire an expert in a case that involves a business because um, there needs to be a business valuation conducted. And that is not what, you know, that part of what I'm why I'm good at what I do is that I know that that's not an area where I need to be dealing with that. Um, uh, when there are separate property allegations or, I'm, or I believe that there are going to be separate property allegations, like my client has come in and said, listen, we're having these discussions and he or she is telling me I'm not getting this and I'm not getting that and I'm not getting this and I'm not getting that because, you know, it's, it's his or it's mine or whatever the case may be. I typically hire um, an expert regardless of which side I'm on. And in, in other words, regardless of whether I'm trying to prove the separate property or trying to be in a position to defend against that argument or just candidly just better understand it um, from a settlement negotiation perspective. Um, uh, lately, I'm hiring them a lot. I'll say that. Um, I don't know if it's because because of the the uh, marital estate is larger in the cases that I'm, uh, you know, are coming before me. And so therefore, you know, are there issues related to businesses or um, tracing issues with respect to, you know, where there's been a house that was owned prior to the marriage and then that was sold and then that went into a, a new house, which then went into a new house. I mean, those are all areas where experts help. And, and um, yeah, I do get them in pretty early and I, and I get them in based on, you know, a, my client's personality, you know, the expert's personality, who's on the other side of the case oftentimes. I mean, you know, if you know somebody's going to hire somebody and you like that person, you probably want to hire them first. Um, those, those, those kinds of factors. <laughs> yeah, I guess it can become a battle of experts if both sides have hired their own experts, accounting or, or, or business evaluation, whatever it may be. It's their experts versus your experts sometimes. But what happens a lot of times, Robin, is uh, 
the experts, the ones that, that Julie and I typically hire, um, are at the top of their game. And so um, a lot of times what we do is, is have the experts get together and discuss where the differences lie. And so uh, we know if, if we can't resolve or they can't resolve uh, those differences, then we at least know where the differences are. And we can, uh, we can basically uh, streamline their discussions. I, I don't disagree that it is a battle of experts, but uh, based upon our experiences, I would say, um, it's, it's really a, a not as diverse as you would expect maybe in a PI case. Yeah, that is great. They definitely, experts, I mean, we, there's a small handful of people who do this and do this well in the context of a divorce case. So, you know, they're always going to have work together on the other side of the case. Typically in like a mediation situation, I'll let the mediator take the two experts into a room and try to narrow some of the issues. And, you know, it, I think that they're actually really helpful in trying to get, bridge the gaps, um, you know, and, and help us understand what the other side's going to be arguing in the event that we are trying the case. So I, I think that is very uh, creative to do that. Um, that would never happen in one of my <laughs> cases. I'll just tell you, <laughs> no way are plaintiff's experts and defense experts going to get together and decide what, how something should come out. That's uh, left to uh, se severe cross-examination and a jury's determination. Robin, can I comment on that just a moment? Sure. Um, what what uh, and again I, I wish you hadn't mentioned the date of when I first started practicing but but uh, because I do speak uh, sometimes in the last century um, what what went on but um, I, I am finding much to to my delight uh, that the uh, family law bar uh, has really stepped up its professionalism. And uh, I hope that one of the ideas behind that was uh, an in of court that we established back in 97. Uh, and I helped found it. And the reason I did was for, because the, the, that was what we wanted to do. So in terms of uh, discussing things with other lawyers, uh, I think uh, uh, we have come a long way. And I will tell you that my own experience has been uh, very, very um, helpful uh, in terms of just trying to get things done, understanding the circumstances. In every case, almost every case, I will go to lunch or at least have a long discussion with the lawyer on the other side so that we can start right away trying to figure out where the differences are and what we can do to ameliorate those. So I, I'm, I'm proud to be a member of, of the family all bar. I can attest that that is true with our last case together. <laughs> we, we had lunch very early on in the... <laughs> that's in I the, forgot. Yeah, we did, didn't we? Uh -huh. and, I, and I think that's, uh, you know, a lot of folks talk about, uh, you know, why you, uh, why you hire a lawyer? You know, when, when do I need a lawyer and why do I hire a lawyer? And, and uh, most folks that I know, uh, uh, whether they've gotten divorced or not, if they've even had a marital spat, they realize that the husband and wife are not objective in in viewing their own conduct where where their lawyers uh, uh, may have been uh, you know do have that ability and that ability to sort of sort the the wheat from the chaff uh, a, a, as you go through that. Uh, so this, uh, to, which to me is new and I, and, and I applaud your professionalism. And when I talk about a cottage industry, Rob, I hope, you know, I, I don't mean that in any pejorative way. I think it's a, uh, I think it's a, I, I should call it an innovative industry, but it's, it seems that this has also spread a little bit to, uh, uh, child custody and psychological evaluations and guardian ad litems. There's all kinds of things. Uh, that seem to be going on in divorce cases now that weren't going on maybe prior to the time you founded the the ends of court uh, uh, there and uh, that type thing. So uh, what other areas are you all using uh, outside experts in, Jillian, and when, when do you bring those in? Um, well, um, in cases involving, you know, mental health issues, uh, drug and alcohol abuse issues, we, we, we use 
sometimes a guardian, sometimes a, um, a forensic custody evaluator, uh, forensic drug and alcohol uh, evaluator. Um, th those would be brought in. I do them early on in, in those cases as well. Now, oftentimes that's not done immediately with consent and, and does take some, um, sometimes a motion to be filed, sometimes, you know, sometimes more than that. I'll tell you, if, I, if I'm on the receiving end of what I know is going to be an allegation about my own client, I'll usually send them for my own edification to get done in advance, um, you know, for, to get a, a, a hair follicle screen or, or a, a PETH test, which is a really esoteric test that allegedly um, identifies not just the, the presence of alcohol in your system, but also the level of consumption. Um, and there's certain sa safe levels and then certain things above that that indicate unsafe drinking. And, and I will usually do that for my own edification, you know, have it done through directly through me coordinating it, receiving the results myself so that it's protected by the work, you know, work product doctrine. So I'll do that, you know, so I have that baseline. And then when and if, you know, uh, somebody says or files a motion with the court that says they need to be tested, I, I, I can, you know, send them knowing that, you know, four weeks ago they were positive and now they've told me they're not using and they're going to be negative and we can sort of hit, um, hit that issue off from the onset. And the same is true uh, in custody cases. Uh, uh, you mentioned, uh, Lester, about, uh, if you will, experts, but primarily uh, we get involved with guardian ad litems uh, in that uh, field. Uh, and, and also it can be a step up from that would be a psychological evaluation, custody evaluation, and those are done by uh, generally uh, well-known and well-respected uh, counselors, therapists, uh, some, sometimes a psychiatrist, but primarily a psychologist, and they will go through a battery of tests uh, to determine uh, the personality and, and the defects and everything that, uh, that, that a judge may want to know. Um, sometimes they may overstep their bounds in, in determining uh, what they think is in the best interest of the children. Uh, but primarily the ones that Julian and I use uh, are not that way. Um, but, but one thing that uh, people talk about all the time uh, is a guardian in terms of having a guardian appointed in a case. And in Georgia, unlike many states, a guardian ad litem is, I say no more than, but at least uh, does an investigative role for the court. It's not necessarily a, a, a someone that takes care of the children or looks after the children. Their role is, is primarily and exclusively uh, what is in the best interest of the children. And so they will make a report to the court and the court does not have to accept it. I'm sure Julian has been successful. Sometimes I have been successful in having that uh, guardian's report uh, not uh, weigh too heavily on the court. But the fact is that um, they, they are the eyes and the ear, ears of the court to, to uh, go out and do the investigative work. And sometimes it's very helpful. Well, most of the time it's very helpful uh, that sometimes you don't have to do that same type of work that, that a guardian does. Uh, but they also do serve, at least the better ones, uh, to, to temper some of the issues uh, that go on during the case. Uh, and, and some are more proactive than the others, and sometimes you want that, sometimes you don't. But yeah. uh, they serve a very, very valuable uh, extension of the court. Jillian, is a, is a guardian ad litem supposed to be completely neutral and then just starts investigating a case when appointed? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, yes. Um, that is what a, the guardian is supposed to serve as the investigative eyes and ears of the court. Um, so yes, that is a neutral third party that is representing the best interests of the children um, and is supposed to investigate uh, facts and circumstances presented to him or her by, by the parties, by collateral witnesses, speak to teachers, speak to doctors, review medical records, um, you know, talk to the lawyers, although candidly that ought to be the least import important part of his or her investigation. Um, and uh, then issue recommendations, sometimes on a temporary basis, sometimes and, and really more appropriately once the investigation has, has been um, completed and then make those recommendations to the lawyers first, usually is the way that it works informally through some sort of joint phone call or 
now Zoom or thanks or meeting, you know, it used to be. Um, and then the lawyers make tell the tell their clients sort of what those general findings are before there's ever a report issued, which then would go to the court in, in the event of a, of a final trial. Um, and I do guardian work. So unfortunately, <laughs> nobody's ever happy really with the guardian. Um, <laughs> it's, it's thankless. And at the end of the day, it, it, it's, it's a very difficult role to serve, um, at least if you're doing it right, which is to, you know, try not to have any preconceived notions, hear both sides, you know, not and and remain that preserve that neutrality. I mean, obviously we're people and 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 guardians are are going to be impacted by certain things. And you know, but I've seen some do really egregious things where they're very clearly biased. And and generally I'd say that that's not the case. Um, you know, you, usually when you're consent when you're consenting to the appointment of a guardian, usually the lawyers pick that person. And in those situations, you have experience working with um, the person that you're picking as the guardian and you are agreeing to use him or her because you believe that he or she will do a, a good thorough sifting job um, and not have that bias. Um, sometimes judges appoint them and you end up, and it's kind of a, a scary thing, candidly. Could you ever have a situation where the two spouses agree that one of them is going to have custody custody they agree okay this spouse will have, have custody but the court says no way gets a guardian involved not, not so much anymore i'll tell you I, I, about 10 years ago i had that exact situation happen in, in a in a courtroom up in cherokee county where the parties had negotiated the terms spent eight eight or ten months um, negotiating the terms of, of their entire divorce including a parenting plan and they had worked with a um, child psychologist, a forensic child psychologist, actually, to put together that parenting plan. And we walked up there with fully executed documents that had been filed in the clerk's office. And the judge said, without any evidence, um, well, this is not in the best interest of the child. And I said, well, with all due respect, Your Honor, you haven't heard any evidence. So I, you know, I don't know how you could make that kind of a determination. And that judge um, said, you know, sorry, I'm not I'm not signing this and, and invited a custody dispute for people who had who'd reached an agreement. I mean, we don't see that happening really anymore, um, thankfully. But yes, I mean, that, that, that does happen occasionally. Well, the, the judge was acting like he knew more about it than the two lawyers and spouses, I guess. He or she, yeah. He or she. The, um, you know, in the, and I'm, 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 I want to ask this in the midst of, all the stuff that we've talked about here, because uh, we talked about all the level of uncertainty to the point where you can't even answer all the questions. You have to get folks from outside to come in and look at, you know, particular, you know, aspects of the case. And uh, again, going back to when I used to do this, uh, I'd have folks come in sometime and say, I want to know whether or not I should get divorced. I want to know, I want, I want some answers to all these questions before I, plunge into this. I found out that there were really two types of people that did that. One was uh, somebody who uh, thought that their spouse was about to file for divorce. And in a small town, they wanted to make sure I wasn't on the other side. So they came in for a consult. So I'd be disqualified and the other side couldn't hire them. But most folks were really uh, and honestly wanting to get a lot of answers about something that was very uncertain in their future and which you know, frankly, talking to you all, and, and even to the point of where the story Jillian's just related, where you reach out a plan, all the parties are happy with it, and it goes in front of a judge, and then a judge interjects new uncertainty into it. So for our listeners that might be contemplating, uh, oh, do I need to get a divorce? Uh, you know, what, what can a lawyer actually tell you about that? And what do you tell clients who come in and and lay out this scenario and basically say, what should I do? Because for like Robin and I, you know, if you've been, if you got rear-ended by a tractor trailer, uh, the, the answer is sue the tractor trailer company. That's, a, that's an easy, that's an easy answer to come up with. And it seems like it's so much more difficult and so much more involved for, for what, for, for, for what you two do. Yeah, I mean, I've been known to tell people that, you know, if they're on the fence about whether or not to get divorced, that that's really a, a, a question for a therapist, and I'm happy to refer them to one, and if there's any hope of, you know, I tell people all the time that you can't work on your divorce and your marriage at the same time, so if there's any hope of reconciliation, then 
they ought to go put all their eggs in that basket and I'm happy to make a referral. And, you know, if, if that doesn't work, then at least they know that they tried. I mean, so I, I tell people that when I think they're in, when I think they're feeling that, un, you know, uncertainty all the time. Yeah, I would say that, uh, um, first of all, I recommend the therapist in every single case of mine. Uh, I tell them, you know, I don't think you're crazy, but you just need to see somebody and you can separate yourself uh, from the actual divorce setting and you can learn a lot about yourself and about the other spouse by doing that. And, coincidentally, uh, you take the burden off me. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and a lot of the time, most of the time, they, they accept that. I had one client years ago uh, I told her, told her to do that, and, and nine months later, uh, she called me up. She said, I'm ready for divorce. Uh, I, I said, well, I thought maybe you'd hire somebody else, no big deal. But, but the point is, that's what therapists are for. And, and I firmly believe in it, uh, and, and I recommend it. Uh, and the other thing, I don't ever try, never, to file a divorce action the day the client comes in or the next day or whatever, unless, of course, it's an emergency. I need them to really kind of firmly believe that that's appropriate. I can't solve their problems, and I try not to answer a lot of those questions, Lester, that you're um, talking about, because I'm not a therapist. And to the extent that I can say, oh, yeah, I think you need to get a divorce, I'm sure maybe once, maybe I've said that, but I can't remember ever saying it. And I think that's up to the client to make that decision. And you just... Divorce situations are unique in the, in the law practice. And you have to have a certain personality to get into it. Uh, and you really uh, have to feel for the client and have some empathy, but you also need to be objective at the same time. And that's, that's, that's a hard thing to do, but that's what you're ultimately going to be paid for. Yep. That's right. I tell people all the time, I never, I'm never ever going to tell them what they want to hear. I'm always going to tell them what I believe to be true. And that there are a lot of lawyers out there that are going to tell them what they want to hear. And I'm not one of them. So if that's what they need, you know, they, they ought to, they ought to leave right then. <laughs> Cause they're not going to find that with me. One thing we haven't mentioned and I'll bring it up. Uh, and this also has gone a long way, uh, in my opinion, uh, to, uh, be more conciliatory between the parties, and that's mediation. Uh, I know the, in the civil court, maybe it's not quite as successful uh, in the civil practice, but in the domestic practice, um, we have come a long way in learning uh, how mediation works, what we ought to do to encourage it, uh, and I'm a firm believer, and I'm, I know Jillian is, uh, and, and almost all lawyers are. Um, I recall my mentor saying, uh, if, two, if two lawyers can't settle a case, we certainly don't need some shrink doing it for us. Uh, or we certainly don't need some third party that uh, is, is uh, going to mediate. But uh, that was back in the last century. Uh, and I think uh, in terms of getting together with a mediator, it has uh, been so successful. All courts in the metropolitan area required. So um, you gotta do it anyhow, you might as well make a good stab at it. And so um, for, for my purposes, I try to make sure that whoever mediates the case is really at the top of his or her game. Uh, the better the mediator, the better the result. And uh, I, I, I firmly believe that is the way to go. Uh, and if you can't settle it, if you can't settle it, let's try it. But uh, most cases do get settled, as Jillian said, uh, and a lot of them, and, and, and a vast majority of them get settled uh, either at mediation or right after mediation. Mm -hmm. Jillian, have you had a lot of success uh, getting cases resolved at mediation? Oh, absolutely, yeah. And I have clients who, who are very resistant to the concept. They think that it's an exercise of an unnecessary expenditure. And I explain to them, look, you know, by the time we are in a position to draft a proposal, send it to the other side, have the other side review it with their clients, send us something back, you know, get it back to us to review it. I mean, that's taken a month probably. Whereas in mediation, everybody is there at the same time, focused on the same case, 
And, you know, and, and it's going to save you money. It's going to save you that time, you know, commitment. It's going to save you. Um, it's an expensive day, you know, and it's an emotionally exhausting day. But, you know, I, yeah, I would say that with my cases, almost all of them are getting settled at mediation or immediately subsequent to mediation. I'll follow up on that and say this, that there are two things that get accomplished at mediation. One is the client is, is given his or her due, that, that he or she can vent all they want to, uh, and it's not like having to go to court to do that. So, so you accomplish that. And secondly, uh, sometimes, especially the good, the, the well-qualified mediators, you may get a second opinion. And so that, that mediator may very well say, well, and you're just, you're just off base on this point. Uh, and I don't mind that at all, I accept criticism. I know I made a mistake in 1992, but um, the bottom line is those two things generally get accomplished at mediation. That was a long time ago. That was a long time ago, Rob. That was when I was still doing divorce cases. So, uh, so uh, that, that's a pretty good, pretty good record. Uh, pretty good record since then. So, uh, you know, what what's changed with uh, with the uh, with the U.S. Supreme Court's ruling in Obergefell against Hodges, which uh, uh, legalized same-sex marriages. So now uh, you have, uh, uh, I, I guess, a sort of developing area of the law in one sense, but an area of the law that's very well developed for what the matrimonial relationship uh, is between those parties. I remember uh, our firm being involved with a same-sex couple that was parting ways that was not married because they did not have that uh, right uh, at that time. It was before the Supreme Court, uh, the Supreme Court's ruling. And uh, I remember, uh, although I wasn't directly involved with it, it was, it, was, it, it was a bit of a mess. And I would think that, you know, applying the traditional uh, divorce rules and matrimonial uh, rules to that type of situation would have been helpful, but has it been? Well, um, one of my best friends uh, actually performed the first uh, gay marriage uh, when that, uh, right after the law came out in Fulton County. And kind of a sidelight to that, uh, I used a lot of his um, uh, ceremony when I, when I uh, married my uh, godson and his boyfriend uh, sometime thereafter. Um, but, but, the problem has been, and I advised him years ago, the problem has been that we have to use the, the, the case law and, and the legal system in a totally different way. Uh, when, when you are not married, you have certain, certain items that you have to take care of, and, and uh, we have to be very creative uh, in order to, to uh, get them justice. Uh, and it has been very difficult, and I think that's why uh, the Oberfell case has been uh, so helpful uh, to those people who, who really legitimately love each other and want to get married. Yeah, and, and I, think, I think one of the problems that folks didn't realize is, uh, you know, that problem was always popularly presented in the media as to whether uh, they could uh, get a license to get married and have a ceremony performed, but it was equally uh, a huge problem in the dissolution of those relationships uh, as well, uh, because uh, we even had a, a, a now unconstitutional constitutional amendment in Georgia, which sort of forbid uh, lawyers from treating that like a divorce in some ways. Well, it's, it's, it's a, it, it really is a field that, that uh, is very difficult when you do have two spouses or two 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 gay people that have not been married, yeah, um, and that's that true. deals with children as well. I've seen that uh, with a, a close friend of mine, and I actually helped represent her in that situation. And it is a loophole in the law where she was in a dedicated relationship before they had the right to get married, and one spouse adopted a child, but it was before judges were allowing two-parent adoptions. Only one of them could adopt the child. So my client could not join in the adoption. Then after Obert fell, 
they get they split up and unfortunately there's no georgia law that protects the non-adoptive spouse and i it's a it's a horrible situation it's a loophole in the law and i it, i don't i don't know what we would do about it but there are i, I guarantee you there are numerous um folks who fit within that scenario sure. absolutely yeah there are well, we're getting close to the end of an hour here. Robin, Robin, have you got some other other stuff to, to fire at them here before we close out today? I, I would like to just hear from both Jillian and Rob about, because, about this, why they chose to go into this area of practice. Because um, as an outsider looking into divorce law, and I'll, I'll say this, my closest... Um, my closest brush with divorce law is that Rob Wellen and I have shared an office space for a long time, over, over 12 years, I think. We, we forget how long, but, but we're office mates. We're not law partners, but I, I get to see what a little bit of the goings on through him and talk to him about some of the cases. Um, and that's, that's my only, I don't have anything to do with divorce other than that. But it seems to me an ex um, very emotional side of law that I, I sometimes I deal with when I'm dealing with say wrongful death and, and really severe injury, but um, it seems fraught with emotion. And I'm, and, and so it takes a, as Rob said earlier, a special person who wants to go into this kind of law and Jillian, you're, you're nodding your head like, yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> it does. So, so I'm curious, uh, Jillian, let's start with Jillian and then we'll go to Rob. Jillian, tell us a little bit about why you decided this was the area of law you wanted to practice. Well, I didn't, that was an accident. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, started out, I started out of law school at a, at a mid-sized general practice firm with a, with a very large civil litigation practice and a very, very small family um, law practice. And my very first day there, and the other new associate and I were sitting in the name partner's office and, and he was talking to us and he said, well, is either one of you interested in family law? And we kind of we kind of looked at each other, and and I said, I mean, I'll do it, and that was it. So, but, you know, having done that exclusively for the entirety of my career, I'll tell you, I mean, now, you know, I feel like as family law attorneys, we are charged with this tremendous responsibility of helping people in you know times of conflict assuage that conflict whenever possible, and and you know serve to sort of get things back under control and show them that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. So. You know, there, there is, there's reward that comes with this practice. It, it certainly is um, full of emotion. And you just have to, I mean, I think the, the older you get, the more experience you get in this practice, you just know that they are relying on you for objectivity, you know, that they feel the emotion enough and, and you've got to maintain, you know, you got to not get sort of dragged into that, to that emotion. You have to be compassionate and caring, but also very objective, you know, and, and um, help calm things down in an otherwise uncalm situation. Yeah, I kind of walked into that same scenario that uh, uh, Jillian's talking about. I was beating the streets for a job when I got out of law school and a friend of mine uh, uh, suggested I go see this particular lawyer, Jack Turner. And uh, uh, Jack, of course, now uh, is well known uh, and basically considered the dean of, of of this practice type practice uh, and I said I just want to know how to try cases and he said you came to the right place and we get in the court all the time and so um, and we did uh, as I was explaining earlier um, and so I, I then left Jack and uh, of course got referrals in that area but then when I became the litigation section chair of the Atlanta Bar I got all these other referrals. I think somehow that you're special and you really know what you're doing. Uh, pardon me, state bar presidents, um, if, if you're the head of something. So I tried, I tried criminal case, tried a, a wrongful death case, tried um, all kinds of different suits, but it all came back to me. All, all those years I kept doing divorce work and I just got, proficient at it and and I just felt like that was where I that was my calling and so and of course referrals were basically in domestic work at that point 
So I think that's, that, that's how it all kind of put together. I think that happens with a lot of lawyers. You just find your sweet spot. and uh, But you certainly learn a lot that helps you in whatever you do. Like I think back on my 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 divorce trying days, you know, I, I I learned a lot that I still, you know, sort of bring forward uh, when I'm put in a new and different uh, situation. You know, speaking of which, to our, our regular listeners and our longtime listeners, uh, uh, Robin did something to me today when we started out. I didn't know what she was going to do. You'll know that Robin usually takes the lead and sort of goes through it. So today she handed me the keys and said, here, you drive, Lester. So I'm driving for the first time uh, without a license. Uh, so if we went over or I missed something uh, with these two outstanding guests, I'm going to go ahead and apologize ahead of time, and hopefully Robin will correct me. But uh, one of the traditions that we've started around here is asking all our guests, how do you define justice? And uh, we, we've contemplated even taking these and at some point making a single podcast out of all of them, sort of like that. I envision it being like at the end of the final four when CBS puts together that big montage, you know, yeah. with- uh, with One uh, shining moment. One shining moment, you know, at the end love of the it. Music. So, love the music. So, uh, so uh, Jillian, ladies first, uh, I'm going to ask you, how do you define justice? I would say justice is um, implementing legal decisions with, um, without bias and um, probably also applies to the political realm, political and legal decisions without, without bias and implementing those, ensuring security for everybody. Rob? Well, in the divorce setting, uh, I would define it as when you go to court and both parties are somewhat dissatisfied. That yes. probably <laughs> is justice. But I want to right. kind of turn that a little bit, uh, if I may, uh, to talk about judges in general. And we see over the last several years, uh, they have become so politicized. And I think in terms of our role uh, as lawyers to be certain uh, that uh, we, we defend them and honor them, we expect objectivity from them, and we certainly almost always get objectivity. But in terms of what's going on in this country right now, all of us have an obligation to be sure that the public understands the role of a judge, and that's to be unbiased, objective, and in fact, do justice. Well, thank you both for, you've been great guests today. I've really enjoyed uh, talking with you, uh, but my admiration to you uh, extends even further to what you do for your clients, and uh, uh, I know that uh, both of you know that I uh, when I when I when somebody does call me about a divorce, I call one of you uh, very quickly and get get your number and get a passed off there. Uh, Steve, Robin, have I what have that, I missed here? What have I missed? That, calling your number, let me just uh, remind our listeners, our guests, uh, who they were and where they can contact them. Uh, Jillian Onan, and she is at the law, her own law firm, Elevitz uh, Edwards Onan and Burline. And you can reach Jillian on her website of eofamilylaw.com or email her at Jillian, G-I-L-L-I-A-N dot Onan at eofamilylaw.com. And we have also been speaking with Rob Wellen. You can reach Rob on his website, Wellen, W-E-L-L-O-N, familylaw.com. Or you may email Rob at rob at wellenfamilylaw.com if you want to get in touch with our guest. And thank you again, Jillian and Rob. Fabulous conversation about divorce, and we appreciate what you do. The story I'm bringing our listeners today just amazes me and floored me and and I just I'm so uh, amazed at this and especially after the the death of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg but there's a woman named Brianna Hill she's a recent graduate of Loyola University School of Law in Chicago who went in labor 
while taking the bar exam virtually last week. Oh. And so it was a two day with COVID, instead of going for three days in person and sitting there eight hours a day, 24 hours, and taking a bar exam, they've now done bar exams virtually, online, and it was a two day test all day. When she first, when she's in finishing her third year of law school, she timed out this pregnancy and realized when I take the bar exam, I'll be about 28 weeks pregnant, no problem. But because of COVID problems, they extended that by 10 weeks. So she was actually 38 weeks pregnant when she took the bar exam. She began the bar exam online and within 30 minutes, she felt like her water had broke. And she started thinking, oh my goodness, no way, can't be. But during a break, Sure enough, her water had broken. And she cleaned herself up. She says, I called my husband, I called my midwife, and I called my mom and cried because I was, I was, I was a little panicked. Um, but, but all three of them encouraged her to hang in there, finish the exam that day, and we'll regroup. So, she gets to the at, finishes the day exam, gets to the hospital at five thirty p.m., and delivers her child at ten p.m. Four and a half hours later, and then the next day takes day two of the bar exam, and the nurses set up a an empty room uh, so she could finish the test and put a do not disturb sign on the door of that room, and she even nursed her baby during breaks of the bar exam, and there's a picture of her holding her little bambino and the baby has a little little onesie on that says mommy's co-counsel <laughs> you know i've heard i've heard the old old thing that uh yeah you know, women do everything men do except backwards and eye heels right but uh th th this 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 takes that to a whole new <laughs> whole new level there well, uh, brianna hill is my new favorite person and i and i think ruth bader ginsburg justice ginsburg would be really proud of her it, it did remind me, I, I don't have a story quite that amazing when I was pregnant and gave birth, uh, but I do remember going back to court shortly after having uh, given birth to my son, Chaz, who's 26 now. And, you know, back then there were no such things as maternity room, uh, breastfeeding rooms, whatever. They're, I don't even know what they call them now, but uh, I had to try a case, a slip and fall, while I was still breastfeeding Chaz and had to pump in the bathroom of Fulton County State Court, one of the nastiest places you'll ever uh, go inside. But that that's kind of what that reminded me of. That's, that's you do great. what you got to do, you know? Well, you gotta that's, Robin, that provides the perfect segue into my, my uh, uh, newspaper article this week, because while women uh, get to have real heroes like like the, this woman and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, I, I have, uh, my hero is a fictional one. And uh, he was in the newspaper today because in the New York Times book review section, books, Book of the Times, the headline is John Grisham brings back his hero, Jake Brigance for a third case. Uh, those of you who are John Grisham aficionados know that Jake Brigance was the country lawyer that appeared in A Time to Kill, which was actually John Grisham's first uh, uh, first novel that he wrote while he was a practicing lawyer uh, in, in Mississippi in a, what's a suburb of Memphis. And so that book was written in 1989. I got admitted to practice in 1987, practiced in law for a couple of years. And when I read that book, I was like, this sounds like the most fun thing you could possibly do. I wanted to go back to my country roots, have an upstairs law office over the public square, uh, and uh, I never had a case that they had to call the National Guard out for. Uh, I did not have uh, Sandra Bullock uh, showing up at, to volunteer as a law <laughs> clerk in my office like uh, John uh, Jake Brigance did, but I always loved the character Jake Brigance because I thought it so accurately in many ways portrayed the relationships and what you have to do to be a successful uh, uh, small town lawyer. And so this new book is called A Time for Mercy. And uh, John Grisham uh, ha has written it. It's his third uh, Jake Brigance book. And today, the day of our recording, October the 13th, 
uh, is the day that it's been released. I have already downloaded it on my iPad and look forward to uh, digging into it uh, later on. And so that's my fictional hero who doesn't hold a candle to Robin's real life uh, hero. I guess until next time, we'll see you in court. See you in court. Thank you for listening to See You in Court, brought to you by the Georgia Civil Justice Foundation and the Georgia Institute of Technology. Please subscribe to this podcast and consider writing a review. You may find related documents to this week's episode on our website, cuincourt.podbean.com. Please send any questions, suggestions, or ideas to cuincourtpodcast at gmail.com. The producer of this podcast is Raz Misher. We thank Noreen Hassan, Associate Professor and Director of Outreach and Community Engagement of the Georgia Institute of Technology School of Literature, Media, and Communication, and the Georgia Tech students who help bring you this podcast. I'm Fred Smith, Executive Director of the Georgia Civil Justice Foundation. You may learn more about the foundation at fairplay.org. On behalf of Robin Fraser clark and Lester Tate, until our next episode, we'll see you in court.